There we go. <clears throat> Today's class is dedicated in honor of uh, Rabbi Shlomo Farhi. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Li Lui Nishmat Rachel Bat Sofi Shafia, Rabbi David Ben Rifka, Shilomo Ben Rifka, and for the Rifuah Shilema of Rose Razel Bat Chava, Marco Mordechai Ben Jamile, Yaakov Yisrael Ben Chaviva, Benjamin Ben Jun Esther, and Rabbi Yoshua Yosef Pinto Ben Zeri uh, by Anonymous. I also would like to dedicate the class Li Lui Nishmato of uh, Victor Ben Huta, um, as today is his yard site as well. Okay. We are ready to rumble. Okay, let me just uh, turn off all of these, and hopefully uh, we should be good to go. Okay, fantastic. So our class, you know, during this, throughout this uh, period of time, we've been going through um, uh, lots of different things which help a person understand the pathway towards greatness. And that sounds like something which is, uh, uh, you know, simple, but actually it's a tremendous, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into, not never mind greatness itself, but even what's it called? Even uh, when a person is looking um, for an attempt to, uh, uh, what's it called? To, to get on the path to greatness, never mind actually being great, but kind of getting on that path is something which is very, very specific and very, very, um, uh, important to be able to understand. So we've spoken a lot in all this, these classes, the path to greatness. We've spoken about the mental elements and the inside focus that a person has uh, with regards to everything uh, that, that goes on. So in all of those scenarios, we find um, opportunities for growth. And today's class is no different. There are two different types of people, the rabbi com- uh, comments, two different types of, uh, of approaches in, in life. And I want to give an example of what this looks like, okay? I'll give you one example. One example is the Gemara, a person sits down and goes to a Gemara class. You know, they go first thing in the morning, they're trying to do the daf yomi. They come in, they're trying to focus, the rabbi, you know, is talking, he's talking, he's giving this example, that example. You got the basic idea. You know, half of the time, I'm sure this, this applies to all of you as well. You go to a class, you come back after the class, you say, wow, that was a great class. They ask you, what did the rabbi say? What, you know, what, you, you, said it, you said it was so great. What did he say? What did he communicate? And, and a lot of times people will say, you know, I, actually, I'm not really sure. I can't, it's hard for me to explain what he said, but you know, I can't explain it, but it was, it was fantastic. So when a person is, is saying something like that, effectively, what they're, uh, what they're saying, they're coming, they're coming down with the basic idea of the class. Is that... Does that resonate? Is that something that a lot of you guys do? Yeah? Is that fair? Okay. Now, having said that, the, uh, this is not something which you experience only with a Gemara class. You could have this um, in lots and lots of different mitzvot, okay? A person could, you know, decide they want to be more strict with the way that they honor their parents, right? Has anyone ever done that? You know, really, I should be putting in more of an effort, Right? I don't know if, again, this is, I think it's true for everybody, but I need to be putting in more of an effort. So what happens? They decide they're going to be putting in more of an effort. They go and they cook their mother dinner. They drive up to the apartment building or wherever they live. They give it to the doorman. They say to the doorman, bring this up to my mother. Here you went and you prepared dinner. You did something very nice. You said you're going to go out of your way. And then you dropped it off and you let the guy from the door bring it upstairs to your mom. Do you understand? This concept, what it's not, it's not saying that you don't have to do everything, you know, you have to do everything perfect. But what the rabbi is pointing out in Mind Over Matter, what he's communicating, Rabbi Perez is communicating is that there are types of people that are 100 percenters and there's types of people that are 80 percenters. You know, I, I did the mitzvah, I did 80 percent. So, you know what? I decide I'm going to be better, you know, a better child, a better son. So I'm going to make dinner for my mother. I made dinner. I brought it here. I dropped it off. What do you want from my life? They bring the dinner, but they don't bring the, you know, the, uh, the what's it called? The cutlery for, you know, so that they could eat it. You, you hear what I'm saying? There's many examples of this. Now, this is not to say that people need to be perfectionists. That's not the point that we're making over here. The point is not that you have to do things 100% correct. Perfectionism is actually, it's a disease. You know, when a person can't find uh, solace, they can't find pleasure in doing something to the best of their ability, it's never good enough. You know, that kind of idea is a disease. You know, it, it can be in certain cases, 
Uh, not perfectionism, but being like OCD. You have obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, I did everything exactly right, but unless I brought the right napkin, like the whole thing is worthless, okay? That's a disease. And perfectionism is a disease. It's not something which is helpful. It's not something which benefits people. It's not something which helps build you. It's not something which is, uh, how do you call it, which is constructive. It's actually destructive, okay? That's not what we're talking about over here. You go to the class and the rabbi says, look, I want to share with you an idea. And he goes off on a tangent. Now, you know yourself, right? That if I'm going to try and follow this idea, he's going to quote some Gemara that I never heard of. I'm going to lose my train of thought. So you know what? I don't kind of focus in on the minutia of this random thing that he's bringing in on the side because I want to remember, I want to retain the thread of what's being communicated. Or a person went to the Gemara, they never learned Gemara in their life. The rabbi is explaining the Gemara. And then he says, let me tell you, Tosafot asks an amazing question. You say, you know what, <laughs> Rabbi, I, I came for the Gemara, you know, I'm, I, I can't deal with Tosafot right now. That's a person who understands that 80% in that scenario is 100%. So let's say, give an example. Let's say a person has 25 minutes. They prepared the food for their mother. They know that in the 25 minutes, they could drive the food over, drop it off, give it to the doorman and send it upstairs. That's not an 80% mitzvah. That's not an 80%. That's a 100%. Because I did it as best as I could. There was no more that I had to give. Okay? But sometimes you have sneaking into a person's uh, consciousness, sneaking into a person's psyche, is this idea that when I do things, I don't do them all the way. Okay? I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And it's not just with mitzvot. You know, you tell one of your kids, would you mind, you know, you're at home, maybe your cleaning lady left, or maybe you, you don't have a cleaning lady. You say to the cleaning lady or to your, one of your daughters or your sons, do you mind sweeping the floor? Anyway, the kid sweeps the floor. Three minutes later, he says, I'm done. You come into the room and there's like black splotches on the floor. You say to the kid, I asked you to sweep the floor. The kid says, I swept. Does that, does that ever happen to you? I came, I came here to sweep. I swept. What do you mean there's a little black item mud on the floor? I swept over it. You know, nothing happened. What do you want, me to, what do you want from my life? That's an 80 percenter. That's someone who doesn't rec recognize what the job at hand actually entails. You know, when people are like this, they wind up actually um, taking shortcuts, not just in mitzvot, but in, in life. There's certain types of people that you know if you give them a job, the job's going to get done right. And there's certain types of people that you know that somehow they're going to cut a corner. Somehow they're not going to file the paper. They're not going to send the email. They're going to say, oh, I said it. I told him. I did. I called. I was busy. Why is that? Why is that? Because you, you gave the job to an 80 percenter. Rabutai, ladies, gentlemen, we have choice a choice in our life to figure out what type of person we want to be. Are we giving some of ourselves or are we giving all of ourselves? All of ourselves doesn't mean you get the job done 100% of the time. It just means that I will engage to the best of my ability in every situation that comes my way. If there's a guest that comes to my house, I'm not going to tell him, here's a bed, here's a towel, that's the shower. What am I going to do? I'm going to ask him, did you eat? You didn't eat? Oh, let me make you something. Or maybe I could order you a pizza or something. You put flowers in the room, right? That's a job. That's a, when someone does the job right. And, and the interesting thing is that quite often the difference between a hundred percenter and an 80 percenter, it's not in their uh, energy. It's not in their skill. It's not in their talent. It's in their motivation. And let me give you an example of the motivation of an 80 percenter. We've got, everyone has one of these in their life, and if you don't, it's probably you, okay? And the motivation of a 100 percenter. The type of person that no matter what, if you give him a misvah to do, it gets done. You give him a job to do, you know, uh, to help other people, or you give him a job to do to file taxes, you know that by the end of the time allotted, the taxes will be filed. The donation will have been given, etc., etc., etc. What's the difference between the motivation of an 80 percenter and a 100 percenter. And I'll tell you the truth, even if it's you, even if you're the 80 percenter, how do we change our motivation? What can we do to become the type of person that really gets the job done right? Now, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, about motivation, okay? What does motivation look like? 
You know, the rabbi is talking about, you know, there was a time, unfortunately, when he had a heart attack. So he goes to the doctor and he sits there with the doctor and the doctor puts, he's got a hearing aid and he puts the stethoscope on his ears and he puts the thing to his heart and he's listening to the guy's heart. Okay? Anyway, he finishes taking the, the exam. The doctor says to the rabbi, I think you'll be fine. Your heart is healthy. You, you not, it's not a heart attack. Anyway, the guy looks at him and he says, you know, can I ask you a question? The rabbi says. He says, yes. He says, you promise you won't get offended? He says, yes. He says, okay. If you won't get offended, he says, please tell me. You told me you, you checked my heart if, to see if I had a heart attack. You listened to my heart. But Rohi, you have a hearing aid in your, in your ear. How do I know that you actually heard my heart? How do I know? <laughs> a good question, right? It's a good question. The doctor smiles. He says, of course I'm not offended. He points. He says, you see that black box over there in the corner? He says, absolutely. He says, that black box in the corner, what it does is it zones in on the uh, patient on the table. It's aimed at the table and it elevates the sound of the, uh, of the heart. And it's actually looped right into my hearing aid through the, what's it called? Through the system. They have the systems in schools today. So I actually am hearing not just the sound of the stethoscope, but the magnified sound <clears throat> coming through a speaker system. And he said, and not only that, it's very important to me that you should understand. He says that all of the medical literature culled from tens of thousands of cases indicates that when someone comes to me with the type of pain that you're describing and their heart sounds the way their heart sounds and their history or family history or medical history is like your medical history is, I know that that is not a heart attack. Are we clear? The rabbi says we're clear. Azaku Baruch, I appreciate it. And the rabbi explained, he said, what did this man give him? He didn't say to him, I can hear. Because really, that's effectively all he needed to say. I listened to your heart. You asked me if I could hear. The answer is, I could hear. But what would that have left in the heart of his patient? It would have made his patient think, Okay, maybe he's saying he can hear because he's a little bit uh, sensitive about his hearing. Maybe he's saying he can hear because otherwise I'm casting aspersions on his ability to do his job. I don't know why. So the doctor went through the process of explaining to him, not just saying I can hear, but saying there's a black box over there that gives it, you know, that magnifies the sound. And the medical literature says like this, and you're wondering if I'm competent in my job, if my if my assessment is accurate, rest assured, don't worry, you have nothing to worry about, you are okay. What the doctor was doing was not addressing the question, he was addressing the concern. How many times is this the case? Where a parent will come to the school and the parent is asking all sorts of questions about, you know, how are they grading the tests? And are you doing this? And did you try that? Or I wouldn't met which educational... The parent doesn't really care about the educational methodology. What they're really coming and saying is, and they're asking for the school to reassure them. They're saying, is my kid getting the best chance at success that he or she could get in your school? I read for 30 seconds online. A lot of principals, they get very anxious. They feel that they're being doubted. They'll say, what do you mean? You, 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 all of a sudden you're an expert on uh, educational psychology? I went to school for this. Sit down before you hurt yourself. Don't quit your day job, right? A lot of times the principal is reacting to the question, but not to the concern. So sometimes it's very important to listen carefully with our hearts to what's actually being said versus what it sounds like is being said. The motivation of that doctor was... He understood, he recognized that it was his job as a doctor to heal and to solve the problems of his patients, both medically, psychologically, emotionally. That's the nature of what the responsibility of a doctor is. So when he heard the patient say, how can you hear? He understood it wasn't a question leveled at his hearing ability. It was a question saying, I'm nervous. You told me I didn't have a heart attack. I'm still nervous reassure me. Is that clear? If this is clear, Rabotai, we come back to understanding that the difference between a person 
who is committed to getting the job done to the best of their ability, or to someone who's trying to skate by, is to ask, what is my motivation? The kid that's sweeping the floor, that even though there's big gunks of black spots on the floor, says, I swept, what's he trying to do? That kid just wants to be able to say, you asked me to sweep, I swept, don't get me in trouble. The kid wants to be able to say to the mother, I did what you asked. He's not thinking, what does my mother need? And why am I actually listening to my mother? To honor my parents requires that I understand what their needs are. In fact, the Gemara says that the nature of kibud avaim, honoring your parents, doesn't mean honoring them. It doesn't mean that when they come in, you're like, (laughs) bravo, oh, unbelievable, honor. Actually, honor means taking care of their needs. The Gemara says it. Machniso motzioi brings him in, takes him out. Malbisho he dresses him, he gives him to eat. Machilo he tucks him in bed at night. Because when you respect someone, when you have honor for someone, then you attempt to understand and to take care of them, to show that they are treasured to you. That's the nature of kavod for parents. It's illustrated by the care that you take of them in a realistic way, not by clapping. Okay, clapping is getting rid of your obligation. It's the wrong motivation. When a person has a motivation to, you know, I have to have, and this is interesting because sometimes the flawed motivation can be to do the mitzvah. Someone calls and says, could I stay over? I need a place to sleep. You gave him a place to sleep. But hachnasat orchim, which is the mitzvah, the parent mitzvah of allowing someone to stay over your home, hachnasat orchim means to bring your oreach, your guest in, to bring him in. And to bring him in, just like the doctor understood, it wasn't just the question he asked, but the concern that he was really feeling, is that person needs to be made to feel welcome in your home. Ironically, those flowers actually, or the extra little one time I went to someone's house, it was like I checked into a hotel. Little mini shampoos and soaps, because who wants to use the soap that the other guy used before you? Little soap, little shampoos, little, amazing. I'm not saying you have to do this, but what a beautiful way of showing a guest that he's not a bother, but he, he's the greatest, he's your greatest pleasure. Fantastic. So understanding and changing and shifting our motivations in these scenarios can quite often change us from an 80 percenter to a 100 percenter. You know, and this, again, this is true in every area of life. And I want to share with you how powerful this, uh, this idea actually becomes when we expand it. Let's take a look. You know, um, there's, uh, there's a fascinating idea that is communicated in many of the sefarim that discuss Musar. And the idea that they explain is that all midot are actually interconnected. Listen to this. It's a fascinating idea. There's a chain reaction that guy that that um, excuse me that uh, that weaves its way between all and through all midot, and that chain reaction is that each midah is both the cause and the effect for another midah. Now, that sounds a little bit insane. How could it be both the cause and effect? I'll prove it to you. So a bad midah might be anger, right? Could you imagine that if a person doesn't know how to control their anger, then that anger might actually lead them to jealousy? We all can see that, right? So you're angry at your friend. You, th- you don't think that they deserve what they've got, and that makes you jealous. So suddenly, an anger issue, which was not a jealousy issue, has now given birth to a jealousy issue. So, anger is the cause of jealousy, but anger is also the effect of jealousy. Sometimes a person can be jealous but not angry, but then they see what someone else has, they resent the fact that they have it, they feel badly now about their life because it seems like their life is not as good as it could be, so jealousy breeds anger. So anger is both the cause and effect of jealousy. Fascinating, okay? Now, let me give you another example. 
being judgmental, right? You see someone, you look at them, immediately you see them doing something, you judge them, uh, you know, negatively. You see a guy, he's, uh, what's it called? He doesn't, he didn't give money at the tzedakah fundraiser. You don't know his finances, but you decide, oh, this guy has plenty to give. I was with him on vacation last year in Aruba. You should have seen, he got the best suite, he got the best cars. Had that as stingy. So judgmentalism, person being judgmental, leads actual, actually to arrogance. Because now I feel like I'm a great person, I'm amazing, I gave the donation to the school or to the charity or to the hospital or to the synagogue that they needed, he didn't give it. I'm, much, I'm a much better person than him. He's stingy and I'm gracious. So being judgmental can lead a person to being arrogant. But the flip side is also true. It's also an effect of arrogance because when a person is arrogant, they think the world of themselves, they look at other people and they immediately judge them negatively. So as an example, if I was humble and I gave the donation and then I saw someone else not give the donation, I'm not feeling like I'm the best person in the world. I'm not feeling like I'm in this high and mighty position looking down on you, being able to judge you and figure out what I think of you. So it is fascinating that the world of Midot, although it seems like there's many, many, many different Midot, actually the Midot are interconnected. They sit together like links on a chain, one pulling the other. And sometimes a person who pulls a thread and they allow themselves to become uh, more negatively focused or slipping in the area of anger or jealousy, what that does is it starts a chain reaction. Everybody has seen this in their life. The most common example of this is pure negativity. A person is a negative and cynical person. Next thing you know, they're talking Lo Shonara all the time. They're down on themselves so they don't do mitzvot properly, right? This is how it is. They're screaming and hurting other people's feelings nonstop because they doubt everybody's motivations at every turn. Are we clear? So effectively, this one little thread that you pull on this thread, suddenly it kind of goes like a carpet, you know, as you're pulling over a tie and you start seeing those lines, each bit, each midah getting yanked on and being developed, a person gets worse and worse um, by allowing their guard down by being an 80% person on anything. Rabotai, there was a, uh, a video that circulated a little while ago. And it made this unbelievable, uh, it made this unbelievable point. And the truth is, in the same way that Midot are interconnected in a negative way, they are also interconnected in a positive way. So this same chain that goes all the way around, right? In our minds, they are diff each one of them has a different name and each one of them has a different element. But the truth is, they all are holding hands. And when you yank one, you've yanked them all. But the, the truth is also the case that if you figure out the positive flip sides and you pull the thread on something positively and you develop and bring that change into your life in one of these areas, suddenly there's a chain reaction for good. And Rabotai, it's so amazing when you see an idea. I think everyone understands. Everyone's with me on this concept. Do we all agree? If that's the case, we now understand the true idea behind the Mishnah, where the Mishnah tells you, mitzvah goreret mitzvah. You do a mitzvah, goreret means it drags. It's as if it's attached to another mitzvah. I did one mitzvah, that mitzvah led to another. Just imagine for a second that a person decided that they were not going to be angry that they were going to be calm all the time. So what happens? Someone gets up in their face, instead of it becoming a fight, and then them judging them, and then them speaking la and then them punching them in the face, and then them talking, what's it called, taking business away from them because they're so angry, etc., and taking revenge and bearing a grudge. Are you seeing each one? Boom, boom, boom. They fall like dominoes. All, all that was, was required was the person to just find effectively one point in the chain. Now someone asked me, how do I know which midot I work on first? If this is true, if I can actually tackle one midah and that midah, that character trait will actually create a domino effect for the good. Or if I stop doing something negative, it will create a domino effect for the negative. Stopping my negative uh, midot from, from firing on all cylinders. So how do I know which one to start? How do I know which one to start with? And the answer I have to tell you is um, is twofold, okay? I'll give you two answers to this, starting with one. The first one is, I call it the gym method. 
Not J-I-M, G-Y-M. What's the gym method? I remember the first time I walked into a gym when I was a young man. I had never worked out in my life. I was a strong kid. I came in, you know, I was always playing football. I played offensive and defensive line. I could hit as, as hard as I got hit, you know, and, and, and I went to the gym for the first time in Israel. Anyway, I walk into the gym and, I, you know, you need the trainer to kind of show you around, to tell you, you know, what's what. So the trainer starts pointing at this machine, that machine, this machine. This one is biceps and this one is triceps and this one is glutes and this one is legs and this one is all the different machines. And these are preacher curls and these are, you know, and these are military presses. On and on and on, showing me each and every one of the machines. So I asked the guy, I said, where do I start? My first day, where do, which, which one do I choose? Effectively the same question. Which muscle am I choosing? And you know what he did? He took two steps back and he gave me the once over. He looked up at me and he said, I think you should start with cardio. Why? He says, because you have a big frame, you're a strong guy, but at the same time, you could stand to slim down a little bit. So I'm looking at where you're weak and that's the area that I'll choose to be able to strengthen you because I know that if I'm looking at your life and there's a bunch of different things that we are not at 100% and nobody is, so what's the logical move to make? The logical move to make is to choose or to find the area in which you feel that you could be stronger. That's the gym method. Now, I wanna share that in a fascinating way, Sometimes something which sounds smart and logical can actually be counterproductive. Let me explain. So it sounds like I'm telling you that if you're going to choose one thread to pull, which eventually will change your whole life. So effectively, what do you need to do in order to change your life? You need to change something. But what do I change? Answer number one, Jim Method says, pick the thing you're weak at. That will provide you with immediate results. Yes, that's true. But it also means that that is the most difficult thing. Let's say someone comes to uh, one of the classes and he says, Rabbi, I'm very inspired. I want to do something. I want to change something. Uh, you know, I, I hear everything you're saying. It really speaks to me. I want to, you know, Rabbi, what am I, what are, you know, what should I do? He goes, I'm thinking of keeping Shabbat. Beautiful. Great, right? That's what you should say. Fantastic. Shabbat, one of the most important mitzvot. However, the guy doesn't keep anything. Shabbat is a big, big commitment, isn't it? So for this guy to choose, the thing that he might be weakest at actually might be the worst strategy in the world. You need to know yourself. And you need to know what this difficult thing that you're biting off is. So as an example, if you're steeped in Lashon Hara, maybe deciding to not speak Lashon Hara is just not going to work. So you'll try, you'll try, you'll try, and then like most people, you'll give up. So what should you do instead? Instead, you should say that I'm going to judge people favorably in my head. That's much easier. You know why? Because I don't have to give up my gossiping crew. I could still make phone calls. But you know what? If I slowly start changing the information here, that when I see you do something, I figure out a way to explain it, to make it not as bad, then suddenly, when it gets to Lashon Ara time, I don't have any material. Do you see? Sometimes the gym method is not smart. Sometimes the smarter method is actually to figure out what can I change? Not what do I need to change the most? Clear? I'll give you an example of this idea, okay? Um, Rav Yisrael Salanter, he, uh, he, one time he visited the port city of Memel, okay? He noticed that all the Jewish people in the area, one by one by one, all of them had their places open on Shabbat. They were receiving goods. They were taking inventory. They were selling, you know, to customers as they came. 
And Rav Yisrael Salanta came and he said, listen, you guys are open on Shabbat. Okay, you're open on Shabbat. He said, do me a favor, please. He says, when you're marking the inventory and you're writing, you have to sell, you have people at home, you're supporting the, you know, the merchandise, la la la, fine, I get it. But he says, just, just don't write. Don't write the inventory down until after Shabbat. I had this conversation with someone a little while ago. Man has a, 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 a internet business and the internet, the site of the internet is open on Shabbat. So that's a question. Right? If let's say I sell beauty products, I don't know, face cream and masks and whatever, God knows what. People can log on to my, go onto my website and order something on Shabbat and effectively swipe their credit card. They've bought the object for me on Shabbat. So even if my store is not open, but my website is my store. Some people don't even have brick and mortar stores anymore. Okay? And on days like today, you know, with all the looting going on, you're probably very happy you don't have an address. Okay? So, here we are, you know, looking at this guy, and I'm, I'm talking to the guy, and he says, well, what do you want me to do? I should shut down the whole website? What Yisrael Salanta said, he said, just take the inventory after Shabbat. One of the adv- pieces of advice I gave him is that you could actually change the website, that when a person puts in their details, it takes the information down, but doesn't process the sale until Saturday night. So you've actually not sold anything. All that happened was effectively that a person sent you an email saying, I want to buy this. Here are my details, okay? This is the object I want to buy. This is my card. But the sale doesn't happen on Shabbat. Now, all of a sudden, that was something that this guy could see himself doing, right? Rav Yisrael Salanter had a great opportunity. All these people in the port, they were like, that's not so difficult. I think I could do that. So what did they do? They stopped writing on Shabbat. Next thing you know, what happened? Slowly but surely, slowly but surely, they all became Shomer Shabbat. Now, if you think that that was only the great Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, and that was only back, you know, in Europe, you know, pre in during the Musser movement, one of my favorite videos that I've seen throughout this entire coronavirus, lots of videos that we're all watching, and not of that, not all of them are uh, are uh, good for your health. Okay, some of them, you know, increase your negativity, your anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the most beautiful videos I saw was of Stanley Chira Alava Shalom. It should be a merit for his holy neshama, Shalomo ben Shoshana. He said, he told over a story with the chief rabbi, Rabbi Kassin. Rabbi Kassin saw him walking to shul one day. The guy was, Stanley was working at the time on Shabbat, like almost everyone in the Syrian community back then, okay? And he sees, he sees Stanley walking to shul, so he says to him, oh, this is much better. They walk to shul together quietly, very nice. After shul is over, he says, you know, tell Leoni, come over here. He brings him over and he says, listen, it's so nice to have you in the shul this week. Why don't you come pray in the shul, 8 o'clock, whatever we're done, 9.45, 10 o'clock. Go to work after you finish praying. You're going to go to work, go to work. But come pray in the morning, Shabbat, beautiful. He said, okay. Three months later, after he's praying with the minyan every Shabbat, they're on their way out. He calls him over. He says, this is so nice to have you with us. He says, do me a favor. He says, you're about to go to work now. He says, don't go to work first. He says, go have the Shabbat meal with your family. Have the family around the table. Sit now, nice, a little words of Torah, sing a song, and then go. What is it, an extra half hour, 45 minutes? No big deal. A lot of people don't have very long Shabbat meals. I have very long Shabbat meals. But you don't have to. You know, get them together around the table. What a beautiful thing. Oh, Stanley says, fantastic. You know, three months later, what happens? He's having the meal with the family. Three months later, he comes to the rabbi. The rabbi says, you know, I heard that your business is doing very well. Is that true? He said, yeah. He goes, so now you don't need to go to work on Shabbat. And Stanley smiled. And then that was it. And then he was done. What a beautiful thing. So why did what Chief Rabbi Kassin do worked? Why did what I advised this person work? How come Rabbi Yisrael Salanta was able to get the guy to keep Shabbat? One method of understanding this is that he took them step by step. My grandpa used to say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One answer is that you do things slowly, but there's a much deeper answer to this. And the deeper answer actually cuts right to the heart of what it is that we're talking about and trying to achieve in our lives. What Rav, Rav Per explains um, using the idea of the altar is that these people who were sitting working every day in the port, they didn't have Shabbat. So you're talking to them about keeping something they don't have. 
Imagine I asked you, I said, listen, do me a favor. You know, I want you to keep flubenschlaben to the best of your ability. Do just, just engage in flubenschlaben for the next three weeks. For me. What are you talking about, Rabbi? What is flubenschlaben? What are you saying? Right? You don't know what I'm saying. But the minute they weren't writing on Shabbat, even if they weren't keeping it all, they were now aware of Shabbat. Shab- they had Shabbat on the brain. And suddenly, things were a little bit dif- different. I want to explain something. A little while ago, I, uh, I approached someone in the, uh, in the education and outreach business. And I said, look, I would like a grant. He says, what should we give you a grant for? I said, I'd like to do some education, some Jewish stuff on, on social media. This is before, you know, everyone was teaching Torah on social media. It was a spiritual wasteland, okay? So I said to this guy, I think it's really important. I want to get a grant for camera crews to do this, spend, you know, $100,000, $200,000, whatever it will cost to, to do stuff on Facebook. He says, what kind of things are you going to do? And, and more importantly, he said, and what is your metric for success? Like what? You're going to do a class, and then after you do the class, the person's just going to keep Shabbat? You're going to teach about tzitzit? All of a sudden, everyone on Facebook is going to have a, the, the bottom, you know, tzitzit coming out of their profile picture? You know, is that what it's going to be like? I said, no, 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 I don't think you understand it. I said, you know what my aim is? I want to own a piece of real estate in their brain. You know what? Even if the rabbi comes on and makes Havdalah, and they never make Havdalah, even if the rabbi comes on and says, Happy Shavuot, Look at my beautiful cheesecake. Just because you had a cheesecake on Shavuot doesn't make you any more Jewish. It makes you fatter, but it doesn't make you more Jewish. (laughs) Right? So what's the point of it? The point of it is that if someone is deciding for themselves, you know, should I marry this girl? Her name is Christina and she's lovely. Her name is Mary and she's lovely. Should I marry this guy? His name is Ahmed and he's lovely. And they have no connection to Judaism. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they walk out? Is this clear? Why wouldn't they just disappear from the Jewish story? But you plant a seed in their head that says, remember, you're Jewish. Even if it's just cultural. Even if it's just about, you know, loving Israel without anything else. Without any other religious concept. You have a piece in their brain that when they say to themselves, oh my gosh, but she's not, he's not Jewish. And, and actually having Jewish kids is very important to me because who's going to keep up the tradition of cheesecake and, and Hamad and Lahmajin and, and uh, matzah balls? And it might be slight, it might be small, but you've taken a tiny seed and you dropped it in and now it can be nurtured. So I said to him, my metric for success is that the person saw it. Is that their rabbi turned up and that's why on Instagram I'm making jokes, I'm doing whatever. Just to be there in people's minds to help them have a connection to the community. And I'll do a chat on a Thursday night talking randomly about God knows what and herring. You know, just so that when people who don't want to come to a class like this... You know, but they just, they still want to see their rabbi. And it's funny because the rabbi's joking around with somebody about who knows what. Is this, is this clear? Once Rabbi Yisrael Salanta planted the seed, I don't want you to write on Shabbat. They're breaking Shabbat nonstop. The rest of, the, you know, they're driving to shul and they're lighting the cigarette on fire and they're carrying in the, without an eruv and they're doing everything wrong. But there was some element that they decided that they were going to do and they were going to do right. They weren't going to write it with their left hand and they weren't going to have the non-Jewish worker move their hand on the piece of paper. All they were doing was they were not writing for the sake of Shabbat. But that means that on some level, they were keeping Shabbat. And then three months later, there was something to build on. Now you could keep Shabbat a little bit better and a little bit better. And now maybe don't just go to shul, but have Shabbat lunch. And now maybe stay home and keep Shabbat properly. The Pasuk tells us, Ta'amu uru ki tov Hashem. Taste and see that God is good. Ta'amu means you can't just see it. Why doesn't the Pasuk say, Re'u ki tov Hashem. See Hashem is good. Because some things you gotta taste in order to be able to understand to have a feeling, to have a connection to it.
okay? So when we're talking about developing a person's traits and finding where the thread I can pull, where's that thread that I can get on this treadmill of greatness, that when I pull this, a lot of other things are gonna fall behind it. There's two methods. Number one, the gym method, okay? Finding the thing that is my keystone habit, it's something which has a lot of other things attached to it, and I'm gonna tackle that. Or having the self-awareness to realize I'm not gonna beat that thing. So you know what? Let me find something else that I can find perfection in. You may have seen a little while ago, there was a commencement address given by an admiral from the Navy. And he talked about how he teaches each and every one of his sailors and the soldiers under his command the incredible importance of making your bed in the morning. Now, that sounds to you and to me like stupidity. Which young single guy back in yeshiva or college or whatever was very, very worried about making his bed? Noah, his mom's not checking on him. You know, it's not like in camp where you can't go to, you know, dinner until your bunkhouse is clean. You're not worried about it. But he said, if you start your day off, your bed is exactly set, you know, that you've measured, you know, the corners like they do it in the military, you know, the, the, the covers are exactly set. You started your day with something perfect. However small that perfection is, it's a seed. And seeds don't need to be big in order to be able to produce big things. Now, this idea uh, of being able to ensure that we find an element of perfection in our lives is something that is a unbelievable idea. I want to give you an example of this concept. You know, we talk all the time now about the viral nature of coronavirus, right? What happened? Some person got one, I mean, again, it's fascinating. One person got one, one cell, <laughs> right? That they ate from whatever or however it started. And then this little tiny thing, this microbial existence, so small you couldn't see it, affected and infected one person. But the nature of interconnected midot don't only move from one midah to the other in a person's life, but you could imagine that if the dad of the family suddenly is not angry all the time, then probably his kids will wind up being a little bit more respectful because he's not yelling at them so they don't need to defend themselves, so they don't need to defend their uh, independence and their autonomy. And the person's wife, who up until now wasn't really so loving and attentive and connected to him because he was always angry and always negative, so it's much easier to avoid a person like that, suddenly started showing love and compassion to him. And now their relationship grew, and now their children grew. But this doesn't stop in the immediate vicinity of you and me. Because our kids are in school and they now go to school with this positive, uplifted, inspired and motivated sense of self, sense of reality, view on life. And suddenly, slowly but surely, this infection, so to speak, affects their uh, peers in class. And this is true, positive or negative. Now, I want to talk about something, if you can forgive me, it's a little bit contentious to speak about it, but I want to talk about it because it's, it's going on around us, it's swirling around us right now in, uh, in, in America. You know, George Floyd was a African-American man who was arrested for a crime. He tried to pass off a $20 bill that was, uh, that was uh, counterfeit. Either it was on purpose or it wasn't on purpose, I don't know. But to me, it's not actually relevant because the punishment for either purposefully passing off a fake $20 bill or not purposefully passing off a, 20, a fake $20 bill is not death. And all of us have seen a video where a police officer sits with his knee on his neck for nine minutes where he literally killed him on screen. I can't breathe, people yelling, get off of him, he can't breathe, and the man dies. The crazy thing for you and for me is that actually, if you watch the video, what struck me was not that George Floyd was, was, was killed. That was not what struck me. 
What struck me was watching the police officer's face while he was killing him. It wasn't twisted in rage. He wasn't angry. He wasn't yelling curse words back at other people. You know, again, forgive me. It looked like the guy was sitting on the toilet reading a newspaper, taking a dump. No expression. It's, it was psychotic. And, and what it showed, what his face showed me, was that he didn't see, he didn't feel, he didn't think that the person whose neck he was crushing with his knee was a human being at all. It was a bug. And I, and I must say, there's officers all around him. And we got a chance to witness through that camera not only one man's disaffected view towards what was happening, towards race or whatever, or towards crime, but we wound up seeing that that was something that was shared by the policemen all around him. So here we are, sitting in the middle of something which every one of us, if we are Jewish, if we have a heart, which is the point of the Torah, the Torah was designed to give us hearts, to make us feel, to give us compassion towards uh, the underprivileged, to give us compassion towards the slave and to the orphan and to the widow. That's what the Torah is supposed to be doing, to make us more godly and more godlike. So here we are in a perfect storm. The man was not violent. We could see the video cameras from before because that was my immediate reaction. Oh, let me see the video from before. And then you see the video from before. And he wasn't trying to stab the police officer, in which case he might need to be subdued because getting off of him might have been, you know, a risk of life for the police. I get that. But this is something that we could all say is incorrect, is wrong, and get behind. All of us. No matter where we're from, Jewish, not Jewish, religious, not religious, black, white, you know, Asian, doesn't make a difference. This is something that every single one of us can condemn. And then the looting starts. And then you start hearing people say, ah, you see, deserved it. And again, I heard these words, it broke my heart. I keep seeing it. A bunch of animals, a bunch of thugs. Are the looters thugs? They are. Are they criminals? They are. Should they be punished? They should. Should the police now, in a situation where everything is rampant and it's dangerous to human life, should they step in with a tough hand and get things under control? They should. They must. They must. But that does not take away from that story. The looters are not related to George Floyd. And their mistake is not related to what, what was wrong with him. So you and I can both say that there's no connection between justice and stealing Gucci shoes. You and I can all see that there's no connection between getting justice for this man who died and you stealing four TVs from Target. We can all see that. But the same way we can create that space between that and that, we should also be able to say in the same vein that we said, look, this is a terrible person for looting, terrible person for destroying police property, because look at what, you know, this has nothing to do with justice, you're just an anarchist, you're someone who wants a lot of TVs, you know, these are all the things that you want to do. We're very good at being judgmental on that, and we are right about judging that, and we are right about saying that they are not related. If that is the case, then we need to not be 80 percenters. We need to be a hundred percenters and say to ourselves, we can absolutely abhor the violence of someone who can be murdered in the street. We need to say that. Now, I need to communicate this. There was a time not long ago where the person being brutally murdered in the street in Germany, in Lithuania, in parts of Russia, in Poland, in every country that the Nazis took over, they were murdering us in the streets and we turned to the world and said, how could you not make a sound? We also now need to have that if we are, not, if we are to be intellectually honest. And yes, it is true that it is very upsetting and very disconcerting what some other people are doing who have co-opted this man's memory, co-opted this man's tragedy, and are using it for their own agendas. That is terrible. But that, as we said already, has nothing to do with him. Has nothing to do with his 
story. That's a difference between a hundred percenter and an 80 percenter. An 80 percenter says, yeah, I feel bad. And then somebody's looting and they're like, yeah, a bunch of them, they should all die. What, what is that? We're, we're, that is lazy. That is lazy ethics. That's a person who's engaged in a conversation, but can't be bothered once it gets a little bit nuanced. Stay in there. Hang in there. Yeah? When you're looking at somebody, and this is not just true about what's going on swirling around us. It's true about the way we view all different people. When we're trying to figure out how we look or how we judge somebody, you know, and then we have a piece of information and we throw the piece of information in. So I'll give you an example. A person did something, you know, under great duress, da da da. You say, this person is not an honest person. 25 years ago, when I knew him in school, he also did this. Sorry, sorry. Do we know that that is related to that? Is that, is that what we, is that, do we know that? Do we know that 25 years went by, he never did Teshuvah? In fact, this act of dishonesty is related, but you've just turned the man from a person who, at least the best I can tell, made two mistakes in his life into a lifetime criminal. That's lazy ethics. That's not being willing to engage in a conversation. So when someone says, the person made a mistake, look at what they've done to me. And someone else says, well, look, why don't you try to understand? I don't care, I don't care. What is that? That's an 80 percenter. Engage. You're better than this. You're capable of actually thinking. And, and Rabotai, you know, one of the things that I saw was that you find, you see mobs attacking police. And then there are other videos where policemen, I don't know if you saw the sheriff, uh, I think it was in Atlanta, I think I remember exactly. He takes a knee down and he kneels with the protesters or he walks with the protesters. And suddenly they're hugging and they're fist bumping. I am not naive enough to think, and I don't believe that you're naive enough to believe that that kneeling down or that walking with or showing solidarity will solve this problem. It will not. But even in that little tiny microcosm, you saw this guy throw his arm around the policeman with a big smile on his face and they're walking down the street together. And he could have been attacked and instead he's walking, uh, you know, hugging this, this gentleman. Go online. I'm sure you'll be able to see it. Go online and see that there's a guy, happens to be a white guy, who is paying, paying. I want, we saw this today. Black men paying them. Go over there and make... Today we saw, also came out in the news that there are random piles of bricks and stones that are suddenly appearing at protest areas. Who's bringing these? Are we not aware that there is a more complex story than just vilifying a color? And if you watch the videos, again, it, it distresses me to see people just paint people one color and one brush. We are better than that. Look, a lot of the people that are looting are white. So, so it's not actually about it. Again, I'm not here to promote conspiracy theories. I'm not here to point a finger and say this is from there and that's from there. But there's clearly more than meets the eye. Okay? Let's just be a little bit more mature in the way we're looking at this situation. So you and I have an opportunity in many, many instances in our life to see a complex situation and to express Instead of expressing judgment to say, I don't think this is right. I think it's terrible. I'm going to stand against it. But I can understand the pain. You know, anyone that's protesting who has a African-American son is, you know, is wondering if their son is next. Can we not, can we not wrap our heads around that? I, I, I think I can understand that. Looters... No answer. Got it. Okay, we're all on the same page. Everyone's on the same page. And there are some beautiful videos. Again, it's important. Educate yourself. Don't only watch one news channel. Neither Fox nor CNN. Okay? Look around and you'll see people when they're dragging cops in the street in Chicago. There are protesters that gather around them and hold hands to protect them. There are protesters that, that held hands and protected a target. They're effectively protecting your property with their lives in front of a mob, you know? Let's be a hundred percenters. A hundred percenters in the way we try and understand things. 
a hundred percenters in the effort that we give towards trying to be a little perfect a little bit of the time and having that perfection and uh, that ability spread to other places. When you learn that you're capable of doing something perfect in one place, suddenly your brain says, if I kept Shabbat when not writing, maybe I could also not drive to the port. I could walk there. It's easy. Why not? And then if I could walk there, you know, maybe I don't have to do the transaction now. I could just tell the guy, you know, come see me tonight. You know, these are the, yeah, that's the price we'll agree on. Maybe I can actually stretch that perfection to other places. So in each and every one of us, there is an opportunity to grow and to walk down this path to greatness. And it doesn't have to be difficult. It can be something small. It can be that when someone in the community calls a black person an abid, you say to them, that's not okay. That's not how you refer to another human being in a free society. I'm sorry. Abid means he's a slave. You, you're going to call him a slave? That's not okay. So to stand up for that in a conversation, that's something tiny. It's one police officer putting their knee down. But I promise you this, even if he did not solve the whole situation, that guy who's got his arm around him, that guy, don't you think that next time he sees another cop, he's going to try and understand the cop as well? He's going to feel that there's some empathy, that there's some understanding in this person who's on the opposite side, wearing the enemy's uniform. Maybe that there's something more than meets the eye. Maybe those tiny acts of perfection, those tiny acts of effort, where we push ourselves a little bit past our comfort point, will actually provide ripples that become concentric circles, that become waves that eventually wash away, whether it's racial hatred, whether it's ju being judgmental of people in our communities or in our families, whether it's uh, finding elements of our personalities that are not as, the, as we wish them to be, and to be able to say honestly, clearly, I'm not perfect, but you know what? I do know where to start. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please share it if the words are, or they, uh, they uh, were moving or connective to you and maybe someone else as well will learn these holy words of Torah, the words of Musar, uh, and put other people as well on the path to greatness. Hazako Baruch, thank you for tuning in.